Um, to come to you first, Richard, when we talk about this, it appears that people are, are really um, very guarded generally. And when it, co when it comes to being aware of scams, we're mm. more and more aware of what's out there. But where affairs of the heart are concerned, <clears throat> there is a vulnerability there, it seems. There absolutely is, Claire, And we are very guarded about our financial details. But what happens psychologically speaking is that when we connect with someone, and these guys are preying on the most fundamental basic need, which is to connect with each other. And sometimes when we want to launch out into a romantic relationship, and we, in, the, you know, in the first moments of that, it's very exciting. Parts of the brain are firing, dopamine, norepinephrine are firing, which really make us feel good. And that's what makes us so vulnerable, that we have this, um, these chemicals being released that make us like, you know, feel really, really like the reward centre, the pleasure centres are firing. And so, not to get too technical, but the hypothalamus can sometimes short circuit the prefrontal cortex, which is our thinking, right? Which okay. is the logic so you're part. you're blinded by love. Which I'm, I'm sure my mother-in-law thought this when, when, when her daughter fell in love with me, that <laughs> surely she's not thinking straight. But that's that part of the brain that short, 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 short circuits logic. And so we might have all these warning signs, someone asking for, for money, but there might be a bit of cognitive dissonance because we see the signs, we, we, we see the warning signs, and we don't listen to them. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, and I was talking there to the superintendent about how specific people are targeted in this way. Tell us a little bit, uh, Nicola, about the, the mindset of the criminals involved. Um, you know, where they're coming from in terms of, I suppose, their motivation and how easy they find all of this clearly to do. Um, so what happens with a lot of criminals is that they use what's called neutralizations in order to rationalize what they're doing and make themselves feel a bit better about it. And from the research on romance scammers, we know that they deny that there is a victim. So they've invested a lot in the relationship because the grooming process with victims takes a considerable amount of time, months up to two years before they even ask for money. And what they're doing in that process is giving the victim a romantic relationship. So they feel like the victim's part of that, that they've bought into this, and that if they're not smart enough or they're not savvy enough to catch on that it's a fraud, that they deserve what's coming to them. So they don't, they're not actually a victim. So that's one of the ways they rationalize it. And they rationalize away the risk by saying that what they're doing isn't really that harmful. It's not like murder. It's not that bad that a lot of these people from, you know, wealthy Western countries mm. can afford to lose some money and that they're greedy and, and this kind of thing. Uh, and just on the way gangs like this operate, um, it's interesting, isn't it, that sometimes they employ a psychologist to work with them in targeting people. Yeah, very... So it's the art of manipulation very much at play here. It really is. They are incredibly good at psychologically manipulating their victims. And unfortunately, some very unethical psychologists can get roped into dealing with these gangs and setting up the best way to make it work. And it is incredibly good what they do. Um, you know, the, the, it's a long game and people don't realise and they're very involved in it. And, you know, the superintendent was talking about how people... Um, talk a lot and give away a lot of information and the scammer doesn't because they don't want to reveal anything about themselves. But that makes people feel very listened to in a way that they might not have in other parts of their life. And that's a very powerful thing to feel heard and feel listened to. And that's one of the ways that they can really reel people in. Um, Sinead, you obviously in the line of, you know, working on consumer issues, yeah. we're hearing an awful lot about scams now. Are you surprised to the extent at which this is happening when you hear of a figure like €800,000 so far this year? Do you know what it is, Claire? I've been writing about this for, for years and years and years. Everything from, you know, face creams by alleged celebrities that don't exist to Bitcoin fraud to bank phishing to all this kind of stuff... I think it strikes me as shocking that it's still going on because there's a huge amount about this now. And, you know, Nicola's been, like, she's absolutely the expert. She's been really kind there. I'm going to go with the line that, like, at this stage, if you have never met somebody that you're in a relationship with, if you have never asked... When I speak to dating agency boss and I say, how can we stop this? They say, if you don't ask for somebody for a live video call early, you are not in a relationship. You don't have a relationship with somebody that you only know online. That's not real. Like, is that... I, is I, that you do, I, it's I do interesting that you say that because we hear of all these catfishing cases and people do... Um, wonder, you know, how can you have a relationship mm. if you've never actually talked to this person 
or, or seeing their face in, in a video capacity, but you're going on, on, on photos online. But people are really invested in those relationships, would you say? Absolutely. I mean, dating has irrevocably changed in the, in the last 15 years. And so how we think about how we meet the people has changed massively. So online dating is, 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 is how most people meet each other now, Claire. So it's not a massive stretch to meet somebody online and, and fall for them. And really what happens is people are lonely and isolated over the lockdown over the last two years. People have disconnected from each other. So when somebody targets you, has your profile, understands you know, your likes, your dislikes, what mo movies you like, what books you read, and they tap into that and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, this person gets me. They, and what, what you said about being listened to, what a huge thing for us to feel, especially if we've been feeling low and we've been feeling isolated for someone to really listen to you and to kind of connect with you in a fundamental way about your needs and what you like. That's so powerful. Yeah, um, you know, when we, when we hear about this and, and, and Richard talking about the loneliness there and the isolation, you know, this is a, this is a scam that is, like I say, we hear about it on phone-in shows and the rest of it, but it's a scam that is clearly growing because of that isolation that people are feeling. Um, from a regulatory point of view, Malcolm, is there anything that can be done about this? I think there is the important message that this is a crime and for anybody who has been a victim in these circumstances, they should feel comfortable being able to go to the Gardaí to report it. Uh, because we are going to see increasing evidence of cybercrime. We are. It's estimated that last year uh, that cybercrime, cyber attacks, uh, cost Ireland something of the order of 9.6 billion euro. From a regulatory point of view, uh, there's certainly additional investment being made in the National Crime uh, Centre. Uh, we're legislating at the moment with the Online Safety and Media Regulation Bill, which will set up a new media commission that will regulate the social media companies for the first time and place also an obligation I mean, on, on them. Can they be held more to account? Can they be, could they be doing more? Or is this a case of, we're talking about how easy it is just to, you know, save a photo, take someone else's profile, set up a fake, fake email account. All of these things are just so easy to do. Is it, it possible to it, do It is. And I think, I think part of the question is around, is around account verification and how you deal with anonymous accounts and bots. Uh, and frankly, my view is that we can do a certain amount as legislators and regulators, uh, but there is an obligation on the social media platforms to do more as well. And some of them, quite frankly, are not doing uh, enough. Uh, it's estimated that probably on Twitter that something of about 20% uh, of accounts on Twitter are bots or anonymous accounts. Very few of them are praising anybody. We published a report yesterday uh, at the Iraq the Sports Committee on the abuse of referees and officials and games. And these are not just professionals. These are people, you know, pitch side. Uh, and there are, you know, these have very real, real world consequences. And unfortunately... And we, yeah, we do make life comfortable for big tech here, don't we? Like with, when you see the number of HQs that are set up and, uh, and the money being made by companies um, that have set up here in Ireland. Uh, uh, with all of this, there's also the likes of how cash transfers mm. and that technology has made it so easy for people to part yeah, with their no, money. No, it is, it is terribly difficult. And I mean, that, that is absolutely the serious aspect of this. It's, it's not about the broken heart. Well, it is, but this is about serious money. Mm. Uh, and, and it is being transferred and it's been transferred internationally and across borders. And there seems to be that the regulators very often and the banks cannot keep up with the pace at which this is changing and moving. And I would say to people out there, you know, you are far less likely to be scammed by somebody hacking into your bank account. I mean, that almost never happens. Mm. You are much more likely to be scammed by voluntarily handing over your own money. Uh, Nicola, what are the red flags to look out for? Like, how should people um, spot this early and what can they do to ensure the person they're talking to is the person they think it is? So one of the red flags is someone who can't meet. So they've deliberately set up their profile so they can't meet. Now, of course, during lockdown, that made things more difficult because you didn't want to meet. And so that became a green flag. But I would say have a video chat with somebody very early on. Normally, these profiles are set up so that the person, usually the, the male profiles, they have some money. If they tell you their camera on their phone is broken, they can't FaceTime, those are red flags to look out for. So someone who just will not meet by video and keeps making excuses. Someone who love bombs you. So they immediately start declaring their love. They're extremely affectionate, extremely complimentary, really overwhelmingly so. Um, and have you on the phone texting all the time. That's also a big red flag. It might feel lovely, but it's not how normal relationships develop. It's a lot faster. Um, so those are really big things. It can take a long time before they ask for money, but definitely don't give money to somebody that you've never met.